So um, Lindsay and I know each other from years ago at OCOM. A lot has happened since then. Here we are again. And um, we're talking about a diet for 30 minutes or so. I was uh, mentioning that it is something that I talk to patients uh, about. We have good reason for that. We have the Sun Sun Miao, one of our grades was at the 500, 600, something like that. He said largely what Hippocrates said, right? That diet is the first thing we try before we go to herbs, before we go to acupuncture and so on. Um, so it's solidly a part of Chinese medicine. Uh, but it's tricky talking to patients because there's so many ideas about diet out there. Ketogenic options, paleo options, vegan options, raw food, macrobiotic, traditional Mediterranean diets. I mean, on and on and on. The, I'm sure in a typical bookstore, the diet book section is very large. And people get very attached to their ideas of diet, particularly if the diet they're on help them in some way with a health condition. So in this bazaar of many options, um, how do you start to talk to patients about traditional Chinese ideas of diet? And many of these diet options have science behind them, right? They can cite a study or 10 studies that were done to show that ketogenic does this or that and so on. How do we give authority to the traditional uh, approach? And uh, traditional, everything is always my interest, to do herbs in the old way, to do acupuncture in the old way. This is doing diet in the old way. You have a challenge, how do you tackle that challenge? It's, it, I mean, I, I tackle it in multiple ways, depending on who the patient is, uh -huh. how long of a relationship I've had with them. Uh -huh. uh, so for instance, if someone is really, we talked earlier on Facebook about the ketogenic diet and how people get really committed to it. Uh -huh. um, I ultimately will, if I can recognize how committed they are to it, um, I want to start talking about cooking styles uh, uh -huh. because how we cook our food is just mm -hmm. as important as what we cook. And then I try to work within the ketogenic diet a little bit with ingredient suggestions. Um, and the goal is to get the person to start to feel how changing up the cooking styles and maybe adjusting a few of the ingredients can change how they physically feel. Mm -hmm. And then once they feel that difference, I can start to talk about what I'm feeling in their pulses whether or not the ketogenic diet seems sustainable based on their pulses. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they've actually felt a shift, they become more invested in it. And it's similar if I have someone who's a raw foodist. Um, usually people who come to me who are raw foodists um, have dramatic digestive issues already. And so it's actually pretty easy to have a conversation about how cooking styles uh -huh. are just as important as um, what we're eating. And it, that's usually a pretty easy conversation about shifting them towards thinking about the combination of ingredients for different organ systems and for their physical and emotional health. Um, but it's a lot of education on Chinese medicine. It's a lot of mm -hmm. education about what are the, the different symptoms that I would expect them to be feeling um, based on the diet that they're eating, based on their pulses. Um, and then we can start to talk about the connections between different culinary spices, different ingredients across the board, whether it's a Pro, whether it's a vegetable, a protein, a grain, or a fruit, and then talk mm -hmm. about the cooking styles. Mm -hmm. Do you have favorite food items that you find yourself bringing in again and again for a typical American patients? Uh, vegetables, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I'm, I am a huge fan of trying to get people to love vegetables. And so there's a lot of people who do already love vegetables, but I find a lot of patients, if you ask them like, what do they eat in a general week? Or I often will ask somebody like, I don't want you to change anything. I just want you to jot down like what you've eaten in the past week and bring it to your next appointment. Um, and then I kind of look at it and a lot of people are only eating the same three vegetables. Mm -hmm. They might be eating plenty of servings of vegetables, but the variety is missing. Um, or they're cooking everything the exact same way. And then, um, yeah, there's, that's usually what I start to see is variety can be lacking, even though what they're eating is really healthy. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot with the very restrictive diets um, of the ketogenic diet, for instance. Um, paleo is not as restrictive. There's, there can be great variety there. But because people have such stressful lives, they tend to shift towards the really easy meal prepping where they're eating the same thing four days a week, like the exact same thing four days a week. And that, I start to talk about how that impacts the vigor of the digestive system when you're not really like excited about your food and you don't have the joy of eating um, mm -hmm. and how that can, and then I'll start to say like, hey, are you, do you actually get hungry first thing in the morning or do you not actually have an appetite until 11 a.m. or noon? And then we'll start to identify that they might have a little bit of fatigue in the digestive system. And it might, we might be able to spruce that yeah. up if we just tweak the flavors and get more variety in the diet. Um, so I, I try to sleuth kind of these bigger lifestyle pictures when I talk about nutrition with patients. Mm -hmm. Two things, one a comment and a, a question. The, about the variety, I, I seem to recall from Weston Price's research, right? He got to so many groups around the world. And he thought the uh, Australian Aborigine people were the healthiest. They were the ones doing true hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And they also, also were the ones with the greatest variety of foods. Over a year, over 200 foods that they were hunting and gathering. And so the healthiest were those who had also, as, as it happens, the greatest uh, variety. Um, now the question, you've mentioned a few times um, a variety of ways of cooking. Can you go into that a little bit? So different seasons of the year um, in the Chinese medical nutrition, East Asian medical nutrition, require different types of cooking because that can imbue the food with different properties. So for instance, we're moving into summer um, and where I live, it's a lot drier and it's pretty darn, it gets pretty darn hot here. Um, and so it's really important, people start to get depleted. There's the danger of getting too much heat in your system and drying out mul in multiple systems, but specifically the heart and getting damage to the heart yin. And so it becomes really important to do things like water sautés and steaming your foods. Um, and, so, and also with summer, we, we naturally want lighter foods, which is where mm -hmm. people gravitate towards smoothies and salads. Mm -hmm. But in the summer, because people get so drawn towards eating a lot of raw food and also physically cold foods, like they want to put ice in their water or drink Right. eat popsicles and ice cream, you can easily freeze out your digestive system. Mm -hmm. So I find for one, protecting the digestive system in the summer, um, and two, trying to protect that heart yin and the overall yin in the body, it becomes really important to use ways that moisten your food and provide hydration. And so grazing vegetables becomes really helpful. And especially if you want, if you live in a really hot climate or you are ex exercising a lot out in the summer heat, I think it's useful to braise not just in water, but in vegetable stock or chicken stock or beef stock. So you're adding a little mm -hmm. bit more of that mineral content back in. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can use the cooking styles to directly protect us from the environmental pattern that's happening. And then another example is in autumn when we move, when we're shifting into that more withdrawn internal environment and we're starting to consolidate. 
it's really the most important cooking style is to cook at low temperatures for a long period of time. So low and slow. Mm -hmm. um, if you are an omnivore, it's really useful to do like those long, slow roasts of, you know, pork butts and pork shoulders or chicken, where it's just cooking at a very low temperature until all of the cartilage, all of the, sorry, not the cartilage, all of the fascia and connective tissue just melts into the meat. Mm -hmm. And again, you're getting that extra benefit of the nutrition of those tissues that otherwise wouldn't just could become part of the whole piece. Can you talk now you've in your education of patients, you've prepared a DVD. Um, do I have the name right? The Ancient Roots Chinese Medical Nutrition for Patients. So it's Ancient Roots Nutrition. And then the subtitle is what Chinese medicine can teach us about our diets. So talk about how you got that idea and what it took to follow through and realize it. Yeah, so I, I have always been just passionate about nutrition, like long before I got into Chinese medicine, long before I studied acupuncture, I've been trying to figure out, break through all the noise of diet culture and figure out what really is healthy eating. And what does that mean? So, um, Fast forward to becoming an acupuncturist, I talk about nutrition at least a tiny bit with every patient. And I just watch for whether or not people's eyes glaze over because if they truly are not interested, the moment I bring up nutrition, their eyes kind of, their shin yeah. shuts down. And then I, then I table it, I just back away from the conversation. But for everyone else, I give little snippets kind of each visit and then the more engaged people get with nutrition, if they're not specifically coming for that, I will give them a lot more information. And what I realized is I was having the same conversation repeatedly with my patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it is education about what to listen for in your body, both physically and emotionally, and then listening to different thought patterns that will help people realize when they need to eat differently and when they need to cook differently to support those organ systems. So I decided I wanted to do a nutrition video series. I tried teaching an in-person class first and so many people told me that they couldn't make the time. And that's when I realized, oh, a video, people wouldn't have to uh -huh. commit to attend, going to this workshop at this time of day. So it was a much bigger project than I thought because I had already created this course. I thought it'd be really easy to storyboard it and film it. Um, and it was, it was a huge project. Um, so it took, um, we filmed everything in two weeks. I took two, th two weeks off from my clinical practice. But prior to that, it was about four months of storyboarding with, my, with a local filmmaker. Um, and then the editing process was was just huge it was an enormous mm -hmm. editing process and we were filming like 10 12 hour days because it just it was a lot harder and the way we did it it wasn't like i could have a teleprompter just mm -hmm. reading things it just because that brought down the energy of the class so right. um, yeah anyways it was it was a very big project <laughs> Um, and then it took a year to edit it properly. So it was, it, when all was said and done, it took about two years from start to finish wow. to, get, to make the video series. Um, and then, yeah. And so anyways, it's been, it's been a really useful tool and it was really eye opening how much work it takes to, <laughs> to film something. And, and what feedback have you gotten from your patients who've watched it? It's been, it's done exactly what I had hoped it would do because in the video series, I made an intro and that's just the basic intro to Chinese medicine. So trying to help patients understand how do we understand disease processes and health. So mm -hmm. I, I talk about what is dampness and what does that mean? Um, how weather patterns can lodge in the body. We'll talk about cold and heat and dryness. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about the emotions and those general associations um, that we as acupuncturists all know and become secondhand nature to us, but it's completely new to our patients. 
And then I broke it into seasonal videos just because I thought that would be an easy touch point for mm -hmm. non-acupuncturists to understand. Right. So, each, so it's late summer, the season of the stomach and the spleen, um, and that's how they're labeled. And so I often will have patients just watch, like no matter what time of the year it is, if, it, if it's a liver issue, I have them watch the spring video and I explain, it, this isn't just for spring, this is for any time we have liver stuff going on. Um, but it makes it just an easy organization for a non-acupuncturist to grasp. And then in each video, the first half is really just me trying to explain to our patients how to be detectives in our body. Um, because we're so divorced from what feels right and what, what is healthy, and there's mm -hmm. so many I guess the other piece that I think is so rich about Chinese medicine and East Asian medicine in general is that we can treat things when they aren't a full-blown illness, right? Where you just feel off, something's not right. Um, and maybe you don't know how to put it into words or maybe you can. Um, and that's something that preventative side of medicine gets lost in our culture. Um, because you usually just only go to the doctor when something is terribly wrong with you. And right. so that has been the biggest success for my nutrition videos with patients, actually, is in each video, I talk about what are the warning signs that the stomach and spleen need? Are you worrying constantly and not able to get off the hamster wheel of your thoughts? and you have some digestive stuff. Um, or in the liver, like, are you having difficulty planning and making decisions? Um, and are you really prone to tendonitis right now? Um, it's time to go get an acupuncture appointment. And so that's where I have so many patients now that actually come in before they have an injury and they know to come in. I had one patient, because I talk a little bit about tongue diagnosis, she saw something on her tongue and her digestion was a little bit off and she was like, oh, I need an appointment right now. And by the time she got in, like two weeks later, I, was, I couldn't get her in sooner, unfortunately, her digestion got a lot worse, um, but she wouldn't have made that appointment mm -hmm. if she hadn't realized that there was something up with her tongue because of the tongue diagnosis piece. Um, and then from the nutrition, the second half of each video takes it to the kitchen and I talk about different general foods that support those organ systems. And I talk about kind of the most common, simple ailments for each organ system pair, and then give people ideas of how to use food and herbs, culinary herbs to address that. And I do, I talk a lot about when can food treat it and when do you need to go see your acupuncturist? Um, and so, a lot of patients are able to really get the basics and we can have a really quick conversation about nutrition then because they'll know they're like okay i know that my spleen is off and then these are the symptoms so like what do i need besides sweet potatoes and then we, then we can talk a little bit more <laughs> and then they're more invested because not only does it save me time explaining it but it also helps them become more invested in the process because they actually understand why I'm, I, why I'm recommending these foods um, instead of like, oh, I have a damp condition and you want me to like eat more like aromatic herbs. Okay, whatever. And then they go home and they don't try it, but they get, because they really understand a deeper level, then we often have time to talk about in the treatment room. Um, my patients are really invested in the food recommendations. Wow. Sounds like you've done our community a, a great service making this uh, DVD available. Of course, this is also, a, I think, a CE course here at Blue Poppy as well. Um, I think, and we have the DVD here to sell, don't we? Yes, yeah. you do, yes. I should know that sort of thing, but I don't. Other <laughs> <laughs> um, specifics that come up a lot, debates around fats, right? I think it was Gary Taub, T.A., UB, great science writer, wrote a book about all the research on fats and how we spent 20 years going, if not 30, going in exactly the wrong direction from where the research itself was leading. But I find it's still 
out there. A, a lot of people entirely petrified of eating anything with fat in it. That there's no concept of a healthy fat, unhealthy fat. How do you tackle that discussion with your patients? That's it's a tough. That is a really tough one. Um, I will often talk about some of that research, and then I also will talk about um, how every cell in our body has that fatty lipid bilayer that it needs. So we need good quality fats. Um, sometimes, depending on what the person is coming in for, I'll talk about. Um, the makeup of hormones and I'll talk about the makeup of like the myelin sheath around nerves. So I sort of kind of try to look at what, what are they coming in for? Um, is it an autoimmune disorder? Is it MS? Is it um, hormonal balance? And then I'll kind of talk about the importance of fats there. And then I talk about the quality of fats and the difference between eating really high quality fats that are not going to oxidize as readily versus ones that oxidize really easily. And then I get, I go back to the cell. So I'm like an, a mm -hmm. fat, a healthy fat is a nice smooth surface floating through your body. And then a really oxidized fat creates this like jagged edge that goes through. And that's how we think of inflammation and pain. Um, and sometimes that type of visual, helps. I mean, I kind of, I, try, I really test it out with each person trying to figure out what is the key to unlock this idea that not all fats are bad. Mm -hmm. And I can think of like three pa patients that I will never, ever be able to convince <laughs> that fat is good. Um, and, and I've tried everything I can think of, and I'm happy to learn other strategies to talk about them. But I do, I just go back to talking about cooking temperatures for fats and how different oils need different cooking temperatures and, and try to point out things like, you know, the Mediterranean diet is considered like one of the healthiest ones and it's full of these good quality fats. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that will get somebody on board, but if they, if they had a cardiologist that really told them they can't have any fat whatsoever, um, right. it's, it's really hard to undo that. Right. Another topic, uh, I think we have a few minutes left that comes up, um, at least for me, my acupuncture is very, as you're aware, Japanese influenced and the Japanese live longer than in any other industrialized people. Uh, I'm convinced minerals, part of it, and that the min minerals from seaweed no other industrialized people, there's still seaweed in Chinese diet, but not everywhere in China would it, you find it commonly. But in Japan, over 20 different kinds of seaweed are commonly eaten. You know, of course, it's an island. And so, so that means they're eating it everywhere. And uh, Weston Price, going back to him, because he was this researcher of traditional diets around the world, uh, he was a, a researcher. He had a staff of 300 and he brought food back from wherever he traveled. And this was the 1930s. The foods he brought back were in terms of macro minerals, four to 10 times, they had four to 10 times as much macro minerals as the American diet of that day. Well, since that time, the 1930s, our soils have become so depleted of minerals. And he didn't know to uh, test for trace minerals back then. That was not on the scientific radar. Now, seaweeds are much more mineral rich uh, than anything that grows on land because uh, while the soil is depleted, the seawater is still the seawater. Of course, there's pollution to consider. <clears throat> Do you tackle at all the seaweed? Uh, issue with any of your patients? I mean, I find myself recommending organic miso with seaweed and certain seaweeds are more palatable than others and people, they generally stick with it. Um, is that something that comes up or do people uh, find uh, the, the taste of the seaweed a hurdle they're not willing to jump over? I think well, I, I would say for the most part, 
Uh, most of my patients are open to eating seaweed and do enjoy it when they do have some good recipes. And then miso soup with wakame is such an easy one. Mm -hmm. And then nori, people love nori. So that's usually <laughs> easy to get people to incorporate those things into their diets. And um, sometimes I will have people make um, like a kakigori. So they'll just cut up sheets of nori and like put it with their favorite like toasted sesame seeds um, to put on, just to use it as a sprinkle on vegetables mm -hmm. um, or rice. And then, but it hasn't been that huge of a hurdle. I, I think the people who would really not respond well to seaweed recommendations are the exact same patients that just, I can't get them to eat a vegetable <laughs> tomatoes to save my life and I have had a few patients like that. Um, I think we all have I mean there's just it's it's tough to get people to love vegetables who really mm -hmm. um, haven't had a strong relationship with them or they've only been served them canned or boiled to death their entire lives um, right. right and so it's a, it's a struggle sometimes just mm -hmm. to get people into the plant realm um, but yeah, I haven't found the seaweeds terrible. And oh, and then another like good trick if people don't like the flavor of seaweed or they don't like the texture is usually the mm -hmm. issue. Um, then I have people make kombu. I have them add kombu to their stocks. Right. Um, Cause that's an usually a pretty easy way to add additional mineral, mineral content without having to navigate the texture. And I'm guessing you talk to your patients about soup stock. Uh, yeah, frequently. that's huge. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's huge, yeah. So we do, yeah, I talk about stock constantly. Um, and then making your own stock, how easy it is to make your own stock, um, strategies for it. And then we're lucky because we have... Um, we have some really good butchers and so we have really good access to high quality bones and, our, and people are really on board with that. Mm -hmm. And I actually got an amazing pho broth recipe, um, which you can get on my blog from the local butcher because he, mm -hmm. he was, we had an amazing pho restaurant here and then it closed um, and everybody was lamenting that. So he helped me figure out a good like pho broth recipe Mm -hmm. uh, make with his bones so it's pretty we're lucky in that way that like broth is broth is a hot topic can you say how people can find your blog so i'm let's see i have two blogs i have the ancient roots nutrition so that's at the ancient roots nutrition.com and i'm slowly populating all of the recipes there from my blog that i've had since 2012 which is called stickoutyourtongue.org so the pho, I think the pho one currently is on stickoutyourtongue.org, um, and I will eventually mm -hmm. have it. This winter, it's definitely going to be up on the Ancient Roots Nutrition. Now, did Joseph uh, mention that you have a recipe service of some sort? He did. I haven't launched it yet. I am in the process of finalizing that launch. So hopefully I'll be launching between July 1st and July 15th. And so what I've, what I've created, this is actually something I've learned from my patients who watch the nutrition video series, mm -hmm. is that they then struggle, like they're really invested, they get the basic concepts, but then trying to turn that into what is what is a daily meal plan look like? What does breakfast, lunch, and dinner look like now? What does the week look like? That's where they struggle to bring all the concepts together. And part of it is because we're all so busy. And we yeah. just, so many people don't have time to look up recipe books and think about this other component about how do these ingredients for the, the season fit in? Um, how do the cooking styles fit in for these recipes? And so for most people, they just have this lack of time. So I realized I wanted to help solve that problem. And so I'm creating meal plans based on East Asian medical nutrition. And I have a general one, which is going to be done, redone monthly. And so that's either a one week option or a three week option that people can purchase. And so people can do a one week if they're really good at recrafting recipes and it sort of mm -hmm. gives them a hint of what to do for the rest of the month. And for people who just don't even have time for that, um, that's why I'm doing a three week one. 
as well. So that will change monthly. And I like to incorporate what seems to be available at farmers markets um, and in the gro in general local grocery stores. Uh -huh. And so it'll be sneakily showcasing cooking styles for the season as well as ingredients. And then I have some very condition specific meal plans. So I have three different ones for menstrual health. So I have one for helping PMS support. So to, it's called the PMS mm -hmm. Tamer. And I don't think I have to explain that too much. Yeah. And that's just a seven day meal plan that's meant to be um, used seven days before a period starts. And then I have the Slow Your Flow, which is about reducing a heavy flow. And that's a 14 day meal plan, again, meant to start seven days before the period. And then it goes through the period in a couple days after for, if, if people don't have a seven day period. Often people with heavy flows also have that longer period. So the goal with that one is to give people a lot of mineral rich foods to support their yin and rebuilding of blood and then also protect their energy and their spleen chi um, and then and navigate liver chi stagnation as well. So the slow your flow is also trying to address PMS at the same time. So if you have a patient that has heavy menses and PMS, the slow your flow is a good fit for them. If they only have PMS and have a, a, a nice, not too heavy period, maybe their period just has liver cheese stagnation, the PMS tamer would be the best fit. And then I have one for, that's a four week meal plan for um, people who are trying to conceive. Um, and it can also help regulate periods. So it just depends. It's called the pre-pregnancy diet. I'm not sure if I have the time to do a separate hormonal balance one. So I'm starting out with just the pre-pregnancy diet. So those are my menstrual health ones. Then I have a heart, a healthy heart meal plan. And I created that because I do have so many patients that come to me who've been told that because they have high cholesterol and high blood pressure, that they need to either eat a DASH diet or a Mediterranean diet, or they need to go vegan. And that's all they were told. They weren't given any help with that. Uh -huh. So I've created a, um, heart, a healthy heart meal plan that combines those concepts. So one's an omnivore version that combines East Asian nutrition with concepts from the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. And then I did um, one that's vegan. And I know in Chinese medical nutrition, we like being omnivores, but at the same time, if someone's really been told they have to be vegan, I wanna help support them with the cooking styles and everything right. that's non-meat. Um, so let's see. And I'm, for, I'm forgetting one right now. So that's, but, um, oh, I have an immune support one and that's not seasonal. Uh -huh. um, it's gonna mainly be twice a year where I do the immune support one. Um, but that's just really when people are going, that early fall season and that early spring season when people tend to get really sick, I wanna uh -huh. load all the minerals and vitamins in their diet to try to help them be as, have as robust of an immune system as possible. Um, so aside from that, every, all the other ones that are condition specific are redone seasonally so that we are showcasing the cooking styles of the season. So for people listening, they go, you said you're launching in July, this will be through the ancient roots. Um, okay. yeah. So if you wanna know about that launch, um, hop on over to my website or my Instagram page, uh, Ancient Roots Nutrition, and then sign up for the newsletter because you'll get a lot of details. And I am, at the end of the summer, I'm gonna be um, creating a program for practitioners where you can use those meal plans with your patients. And I'm gonna give you some guidance and we're gonna create basically a wholesale um, affiliate program account for that. But first I have to launch the initial program mm -hmm. and then I will get the affiliate program set up. Uh, yeah, and Cloud Forest Acupuncture just asked if I sell them wholesale, but we are we are going to make that we're going to make an affiliate program happen at the end of the summer. I love great ideas, people doing things that others aren't doing, and uh, this all the 
great work on your part to bring, bring these and offer them to our uh, Chinese medicine uh, community. We had said we were going to talk for half an hour. We're over that. So uh, I think I'll close thanking you for your time, reminding people we have your DVD here at Blue Poppy. We have your CE course. And uh, one last reminder, ancient roots nutrition uh, dot com. Yes. Yeah. And um, thank you so much, Lindsay. It's been wonderful to reconnect. Thank you so much. It's been it has been wonderful to reconnect. I hope, yeah. Thank you. Have a yeah. lovely day. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.